Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to everyone that's here. Appreciate uh, you all taking time so close to the holiday season to be with us today, that's for certain. Uh, this hearing builds upon the Energy and Commerce Committee's impressive record of hearings on energy security, job creation, and infrastructure. One of the many things that I appreciate about this subcommittee is that we have members who represent both northern and southern border states. As a proud Michigander, I'll be focusing my comments and questions more on our relationship with Canada, while I'm sure my friends from Texas it's a nice win by Michigan over Texas in basketball last night. Uh, we'll be focusing more on Mexico. Uh, but one thing I want to make clear, this hearing is about North American integration, specifically the impacts and future of North American energy trade. I want to examine how North American energy trade has strengthened all of our economies and our trading relationships. Nationally, 14 million jobs are tied to trade with Mexico and Canada. In Michigan, it's nearly 400,000. This trade makes us more competitive internationally and can prove to be the difference between creating or shedding jobs. 84% of petroleum and coal products exported from Michigan go either to Mexico or Canada. The energy markets of Canada, Mexico, and the U.S. are becoming increasingly interdependent, thanks in large part to the free trade status of energy commodities. When we think about energy trade, we're including crude oil, refined petroleum products, and other liquids, natural gas, and electricity. To sum it up, we have transmission lines that go across the border, we've got pipelines that go across or under the border, and we have goods and services that go across the border as well. Energy trade is much more than just commodities. There's also a huge supply chain supporting everything. The multiplier effect of energy trade is great through our, our economy. Trilateral engagement is not just about trade, but also about information sharing just last month. Energy Information Administration announced the launch of a website on North American Cooperation on Energy Information, or NACEI. This resource consolidates energy-related data, maps, references from the U.S., Canada, and Mexico. The current areas of focus include comparing, validating, and improving respective energy import and export information, sharing publicly available geospatial information related to energy infrastructure, and exchanging views and information on protection of cross-border energy flows with the harmonization term terminology, concepts, and the definitions of energy products. This will allow each country to work together for the benefit of all three countries. The centerpiece of our trade relationship, of course, is NAFTA, which entered into a force on January 1st, 1994. On May 18th of this year, the Trump administration sent a 90-day notification to Congress of its intent to begin talks with Canada and Mexico to renegotiate NAFTA. Currently, negotiations are holding intercessional meetings in Washington through mid-December in advance of a six-round of negotiations, which are scheduled to be held from January 23rd to the 28th in Montreal. My expectation is that today's hearing will provide some context for the NAFTA negotiations. I look forward to hearing the testimony of our witnesses and engaging in a conversation about the benefits of a robust North American energy sector. And with that, I yield to the ranking member of the subcommittee, Mr. Rush. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this important hearing on the impact and future of the North American energy trade. Mr. Chairman, I have held several meetings with relevant stakeholders concerned with the Trump administration's ill-advised decision to try and unilaterally change or get rid of existing agreements, existing accords, and treaties. Unfortunately, Mr. Chairman, We've heard the president talk of reneging on a vast array of deals signed by previous administrations on everything from the Iran nuclear deal to the Paris Agreement up to and including major trade agreements such as NAFTA. Personally, Mr. Chairman, while I did not vote for NAFTA when it came before the House, I do have concerns over the constitutionality of a president single-handedly changing or overturning a trade agreement that was passed by a Congress. <clears throat> Additionally, Mr. Chairman, 
and as importantly, I also have grave concerns over the global perception of the credibility of the United States when neither our friend or allies nor other foreign powers can depend on the sincerity of the U.S. government is, if, if anything, a new president, and if, if at any time a new president takes office, he or she chooses to reverse or renege on agreements signed under the previous administration. Unfortunately, Mr. Chairman, this appears to me a recurring theme of this president's chaotic governing philosophy, where no previous accord is ever safe from interference, and any promise can be voided at any time, regardless if it is made to friend or foe. Mr. Chairman, based just on the merits, the Energy Information uh, Administration estimates that energy trade between the North American countries exceeded $140 billion just in 2015 alone, and with the U.S. importing an estimated $100 billion and exporting over $40 billion in energy products with Canada and Mexico. Additionally, Mr. Chairman, just last year, former President Obama signed the North American Climate, Clean Energy, and Environmental Environment Partnership along with his counterparts from Canada and Mexico. This important agreement established several objectives, Mr. Chairman, and benchmarks aimed at advancing clean energy and reducing climate changing, climate inducing pollutants between all three countries with the goal of 50% clean power generation by the year 2025. Mr. Chairman, this pact will also help to develop cross-border transmission projects while improving and aligning appliance and equipment efficiency standards between all three partners. At a time when the U.S. has become more intertwined and interdependent in our dealings with other countries, both economically as well as for national security purposes, we cannot expect to be seen as a credible leader within the global arena, while at the very same time thumbing our nose at previous deals and agreements just because they were signed by a president from another party. Instead, we must show leadership in Congress to demonstrate to our friends and allies as well as to our foes and competitors that the U.S. will honor the deals that we signed and we will not renege on our promises. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you and I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today and also want to, at the same time, welcome our witnesses. <laughs> now you're back to balance of my time. Chairman yields back. I know that the Chairman of the Full Committee is on his way from the hearing that's downstairs, so at this point I'll yield uh, five minutes to the ranking member of the Full Committee, Mr. Pallone. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, regardless of the outcome of the current NAFTA talks, the U.S. will continue to trade fossil fuel commodities with Canada and Mexico for years to come, and I'd like to see a change in our focus. Rather than focusing on trading fossil fuel commodities, we should prioritize expansion of renewable energy technologies and how they can benefit the North American electricity grid. According to the Energy Information Administration, more than half of new electricity generating capacity added to the grid between 2014 and 16 came from renewable technologies. And we should look at expanding this technology so that we can make renewables a larger part of our electric exports. In 2009, the U.S.-Canada Clean Energy Dialogue was launched to encourage clean energy technology development among our two nations. One key aspect of this collaboration focused on expanding and modernizing the North American transmission grid to facilitate movement of renewable power between the United States and Canada. And right now, there are several large-scale transmission projects in the works to bring renewable power across the United States borders with Canada and Mexico. And the modernization of the grid in order to facilitate these types of projects is critical to the overall future of energy development in North America. 
The United States has also forged a strong agreement with Canada and Mexico to address climate pollution and advance clean energy. In 2016, the countries established the North American Climate, Clean Energy and Environment Partnership. Collectively, the partnership set a goal of 50 percent clean power generation and a more than 40 percent reduction in methane emissions by 2025. And the Trump administration has been silent on this commitment. But based on the President's foolish decision to walk away from the Paris Climate Agreement, I do not have high hopes that he will fulfill this commitment. It is unfortunate that the Republican majority has focused today's hearing primarily on fossil fuels. Instead, I believe it is even more important for us to focus on ways we can continue to work with our neighbors to reduce carbon emissions and expand trade in clean energy technologies. We have a knowledgeable panel of witnesses before us, and I look forward to hearing their testimony. Um, I don't know if anyone else wanted part. Yes, I'm, I yield the remainder of my time to Mr. Green. Thank you, uh, Ranking Member, for yielding to me. Energy trade between the U.S., Canada, and Mexico has been an all-time high in recent years. Where the U.S. is largest producer of crude oil in the continent, Canadian reserves are far outstrip our own. Mexico also has significant discoveries of offshore sites in the Gulf over this summer. Many Texas refineries rely on Mexican imports for their source of crude oil. At the end of this year, Mexico has a demand of about 600,000 barrels a day of gasoline imports due to their lack of refining capacity. Uh, a huge percentage of this 600,000 barrels a day will come from the uh, refinery complexes we have along the uh, Texas Gulf Coast. While the U.S. and Canada have integrated our energy markets to a great degree post-NAFTA and with Mexico's recent reforms in the coming years, cooperation among the companies, countries will only get gold when discussed discussing how to improve NAFTA should be closer ties and friendship among all three countries. Our second goal should be an integrated North American energy market. This is one reason I introduced uh, our cross-border infrastructure bill with our colleague uh, Representative Mullins earlier this year. There are 11 cross-border projects awaiting a decision by the Department of State and the President, including electric lines and water pipelines. It is Congress' responsibility to create the regulatory rules by which infrastructure is constructed. Our bill, H.R. 2883, which passed our committee and the floor of the House, would create a regulatory process at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, Department of State, Department of Energy to permit cross-border infrastructure by recognizing the energy trade between Mexico, Canada uh, is in our national interest. It is my hope that the Senate will soon take up this language so we can continue building on that success and we should embrace the changes taking place in North America and harmonize our policies with those of our neighbors to the North and the South. And again, thank you for the time for our ranking member. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. We are ready for the testimony. I, I want to appreciate uh, our, our witnesses providing the testimony in advance, be made part of the record. Uh, you will be given each uh, the opportunity to uh, take five minutes to summarize uh, that statement, then we will we'll begin with questions. Our witnesses today, Karen Harbert, President and CEO, Global Energy Institute, U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and a former Undersecretary from the Department of Energy, goes back a long ways. Chet Thompson, President of the American Fuel and Petrochemical Manufacturers. Uh, Alan Burchett, uh, Global Head of Strategic Projects on behalf of the National Association of Manufacturers, and Alan Krupnik, Senior Fellow for the Resources for the Future. Ms. Harbert, we'll start with you. Welcome. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Ranking Member Rush and all members of the committee. As the Chairman said, I'm Karen Harbert, President and CEO of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce's Global Energy Institute. As many of you have noted, the U.S., Canada, and Mexico have a long history of shared energy trade, but for most of that time, as a global economic leader and a large energy consumer, the U.S. has been purchasing large supplies of oil and natural gas from both nations. Today, the U.S. has the largest hydrocarbon resource base in the world, plus very large nuclear and renewable bases in this country. The speed with which the U.S. has moved from energy scarcity to abundance has been nothing short of breathtaking. The U.S. is fortunate to have two neighboring countries, Canada and Mexico, that are also large energy producers. Canada ranks number eighth globally and Mexico 24th. Unthinkable 10 years ago today, North America's abundant energy resources are upending the global energy market. Combined production from the U.S., Canada, and Mexico accounts for 19 percent of all crude oil, 20 percent of natural gas, and 12 percent of all coal output. 
Having a large share of world energy production in North America not only helps our own energy and national security, it also helps global energy security by diversifying supplies, ensuring that a large share of global output occurs in reliable countries. We have always had a very open trade relationship with Canada. While our trade relationship with Mexico has traditionally been strong, Mexico has long prohibited foreign investment in its hydrocarbon sector. But that all changed in 2013 when Mexico instituted constitu constitutional reforms to put an end to the more than 70-year monopoly enjoyed by state-owned oil company Pemex. Today, the U.S. is a net importer of crude oil from both Mexico and Canada. In 2016, the U.S. imported about 580,000 barrels per day from Mexico and nearly 3 million barrels per day from Canada. Notably, the U.S. now imports more oil from Canada and Mexico than OPEC. That's very important to take note of. Since 2011, the U.S. has been a net exporter of refined products. There is lively trade in products among U.S., Canada, and Mexico, and the, trade and the trends now favor the United States, growing its share. Although the U.S. is a net importer of natural gas from Canada, that is not expected to remain much longer. The U.S. has been a net exporter of gas to Mexico since the mid-1980s, and exports are growing tremendously. As more infrastructure is added, linking the U.S. and Canada, we welcome legislation to facilitate that, we expect that the U.S. will be a net exporter to both countries. In 2016, Mexico and Canada accounted for 13% of all U.S. net coal exports, which yielded a $440 million trade surplus. We expect the downward trend in coal exports to continue and exports to other countries to grow. We have a growing and integrated electricity market. There are 25 transmission crossings between the U.S. and Canada and 11 crossings between the United States and Mexico. So in summary, for the last six years, we have been running a trade surplus with Canada and Mexico in refined petroleum and coal. And while the trade, the trade deficit in oil and gas remains, it will be shrinking rapidly. The abundance of affordable energy in North America has given U.S. businesses a critical leg up. We pay about two to four times less for natural gas, coal, and electricity than many of our competitors. But the benefits aren't limited to just industry. It's consumers, too. Over the last six years, average annual household energy expenditures declined by 14.1%. Now on to NAFTA. As these trends demonstrate, the U.S. energy economy has nothing to fear from NAFTA and a lot to gain. A modernized NAFTA could sustain advantages for North American industry and advance the market-based integration of our energy sectors. However, we are concerned that withdrawing from NAFTA would impose unacceptably high costs to the U.S. when we are engaged in historic tax reform and regulatory reform to get our economy growing above 3 percent. We are also worried about attempts to undermine the investor state dispute settlement protections in NAFTA, which are indispensable to maintaining our growing energy sector and provide neutral arbitration to ensure other countries treat our investors fairly. In short, the robust energy trade amongst the U.S., Canada, and Mexico would be threatened by a withdrawal from NAFTA. Given all of this, it is our strongest recommendation that if NAFTA modernization cannot be reached, that the administration must retain its commitment to the current trade agreement. Today, the story of North American energy is one of increased economic, national, and energy security for all three countries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Thompson. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Chairman Upton, Ranking Member Rush, and the rest of the subcommittee members for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Chet Thompson. I'm the President of the American Fuel and Petrochemical Manufacturers. AFPM represents 97 percent of the nation's refining and petrochemical manufacturing capacity, including 118 refineries, 248 petrochemical facilities, and 33 states. We support more than 3 million jobs and add approximately $600 billion each year to the U.S. economy. Our members make the gasoline, the diesel, the jet fuel, and the petrochemicals that make our modern way of life possible. We are the world's largest refining industry today and a global leader in petrochemical production, making us the backbone of global manufacturing and transportation. Our energy trade relationships with Canada and Mexico are critical to enhancing our position. I'm going to expand, or I'd like to expand, on only a few points in my written testimony. First, Canada and Mexico are helping us achieve North American energy security. 
Although U.S. crude production has increased dramatically over the last you know, decade or so, our refineries still import, on average, 8 million barrels a day of crude. Canada and Mexico combined to supply nearly half of this volume. In fact, Canada is the largest supplier of crude oil to the U.S., supplying more than 3 million barrels a day, or 41 percent of all of our imports. We get more from Canada than all the other OPEC members combined. Mexico supplies 600,000 barrels a day. They're our fourth largest supplier, representing 7 percent. Not only do we support to our neighbors, um, or import from our neighbors, but we also export a, a substantial amount of our energy as well. The U.S. exports nearly 5 million barrels per day of petroleum products. About a third of that uh, goes to Canada and Mexico each year. Mexico is our largest export market for U.S. refined products. Last year, we exported approximately 14 billion gallons of petroleum products to Mexico. This helped meet more than half of their gasoline demand and c contributed approximately 11 billion dollars of energy trade surplus, surplus with Mexico. Likewise, we exported almost 9 billion gallons to Canada. Together, exports to Canada and Mexico have grown from essentially zero before NAFTA to more than 1.4 million barrels per day. That's about 7 percent of our total refining uh, production and about a third of our exports just to those two countries alone. As a result of our increased energy production and the increasingly integrated North American energy market, the IEA now projects that North America will be energy secure by 2020. This is good for our country and it's good for the American consumer. We also export a substantial volume of chemicals to both Mexico and Canada. Trade in all chemicals has more than tripled over the last two decades from approximately 20 billion in 1994 to 63 billion in 2014. My second point, North American trade is, is growing our economy. Our relationships with Canada and Mexico have made our energy industry strong, and that strength has attracted more investment. Indeed, right now, there's more than $185 billion in the queue for further investments in our refining and petrochemical industries. With that investment comes the need for more employment and a strong workforce. Demand for skilled labor positions is expected to grow by 12% by 2024. We will hire additional skilled labor to work as welders, electricians, pipe fitters, boiler makers, and many other pos uh, uh, positions. Changes in the global energy market, advances in technology, and legal reforms will provide further opportunities for U.S. companies. For example, the opening of the Mexican energy sector has allowed us to compete and sell our products in Mexico, leading to billions of dollars of investment by U.S. companies. My last point I'd like to make is that AFPM fully supports NAFTA and believes it helps achieve energy security. North American energy security is the result of our plentiful natural resources that we're blessed with, the ingenuity of our energy sector, but also NAFTA. NAFTA has played a very important role in our growth. Thus, we support the continuation of NAFTA but think the agreement should be modernized. For example, NAFTA's investment protection should be strengthened consistent with other more recent U.S. free trade agreements, or at the very least, investor protections must be maintained. Second, NAFTA should help increase regulatory coordination and cross-border energy infrastructure. Finally, NAFTA customs procedures should be streamlined and modernized to reflect the way that energy and petrochemical trading uh, occurs today across our borders. So again, I appreciate the opportunity to be here and look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Krupnik. Uh, Mr. Chairman. You got to hit that button. Oh. There we go. Mr. Chairman, uh, ranking member and other members of this subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to speak today about energy trade with our Mexican and Canadian neighbors. I come before you as an economist, the senior fellow and leader of a North American energy initiative at Resources for the Future. RFF's mission is to improve environmental energy and natural resource decisions through impartial economic research and policy engagement. RFF is non-advocacy and does not take positions on issues, so these opinions uh, are mine. Today I'm here to advocate for greater harmonization and integration of energy markets 
and economic and environmental policies across the three countries. And I'm very happy to hear the words today, harmonization and integration across the aisle uh, at this hearing from, uh, from the members. That's great. Um, so with appropriate policies and agreements with our neighbors, North America can be the world's energy power powerhouse. Free en trade in energy and electricity promises greater economic prosperity, a cleaner environment, and greater energy security in all three countries. These countries have been moving towards harmonization in these sectors for years now. On the economic front, the uh, Mexican energy reforms opened up oil and gas leasing and exploitation to U.S. companies. The reforms also expanded markets for our pipelines, generation technology, and natural gas. Uh, Mexico continues to greatly increase natural gas imports from the U.S. to replace oil-fired generation. This development will reduce electricity generation costs, lower air pollution emissions from power plants, and increase energy security for Mexico, which is a good thing. And U.S. producers have access to a large market for their natural gas. If, however, NAFTA negotiations go badly or if political interference in this trade occurs, we could see increased costs and delays in exporting gas. We might even run the risk of Mexico eventually turning away from the U.S. as a supplier. And we certainly wouldn't th want that for American producers or Mexican consumers. The electricity sector, likewise, can benefit from increased integration. We have found that cross-border interconnections and capacity planning occur less frequently than they should to maximize electricity reliability. On the environmental front, as was mentioned, during the Obama administration, the U.S. became party to several tripartite agreements to improve energy efficiency, reduce methane emissions, work towards major CO2 reductions. These gains are being reversed by the Trump administration, even as Canada and Mexico continue to solidify their policies to reduce greenhouse gases. Canada has implemented a national carbon price for provinces that do not already have a price or trading system. Mexico, along with its limited carbon tax, is in the process of implementing a pilot cap and trade program and joining California and uh, some Canadian provinces in that. So what can be done in general and specifically by Congress to realize the benefits of greater harmonization? First, the bill that you've uh, uh, introduced is a, is a great start. And be vocal in supporting free energy trade and investment protections already in NAFTA. Be wary of unintended consequences of NAFTA failing. Second, remember that as the U.S. continues to roll back climate regulations, such as its methane rules, then our neighbors may grow increasingly concerned about competitiveness issues. Mexico and Canada may likewise become hesitant in efforts to align environmental policies in the future, limiting our opportunities that might improve environmental outcomes at lower cost to the private sector and consumers here in the United States. Third, Congress can support past and future efforts to align economic, environmental, and safety regulations for offshore drilling in the Gulf of Mexico. There's already an agreement to build upon, and DOI has worked closely with Mexican regulators to share best practices and align offshore safety regulations. Such work should continue so that we can ensure successful and responsible offshore drilling. Fourth, Congress can help promote, along with our neighbor's counterparts, the vision of renewable capacity growth in areas that capture their locational advantages, for instance, solar in Mexico, hydro in Canada, for selling into an integrated North American grid. Lastly, Congress can work to further improve the U.S. infrastructure siting and permitting process. Pipelines, transmission lines are needed to execute this vision for a North America uh, system. Streamlining and strengthening this process can occur while improving environmental and social outcomes, for example, by using cost-benefit analysis and permitting decisions. As our two neighbors are likewise facing similar challenges in this area, we should aim to share best practice. So ultimately, the fates of the Mexican, Canadian, U.S. energy sectors are intertwined. This interdependence actually benefits the three countries, increases our joint energy security. Congress can play an important role in seeing this vision become a reality. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Burchett. Good morning, Chairman Upton, Ranking Member Rush, members of the subcommittee, and my fellow panelists. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Alan Burchett, and I am Global Head of Strategic Projects for ABB. I am testifying 
behalf of the National Association of Manufacturers, which represent nearly 14,000 small, medium, and large manufacturers in every industrial sector and in all 50 states. We are the number one manufacturer of power grids in the world and a leader of in, in industrial automation for the petrochemical industries. We are the number one producer of electric motors and the second larger producer of electric drives and industrial robots. We supply the energy, electricity, and manufacturing sectors with enabling technologies that help them stay competitive. ABB has a strong and growing U.S. manufacturing footprint and is proud of our 20,000 employees across 50 manufacturing facilities, including those in Michigan, Texas, Oklahoma, Ohio, Virginia, and North Carolina, which is home to our U.S. headquarters. Over the past decade, we've invested over $11 billion in the United States, tripling our workforce. We have chosen to invest in the U.S. because it's our largest market worldwide, and we believe in being close to our customer. We believe in the American worker. A strong North American supply chain has supported our domestic growth and investments, enabling ABB to competitively manuf manufacture here. For manufacturers throughout the U.S., the North American commercial market is the most important market in the world. Over 60 percent of U.S. manufacturing output in 2016, $1.36 trillion, was sold in the U.S., Canada, and Mexico. Canada and Mexico alone purchased one-fifth of all U.S. manufactured goods in 2016, more than the next 10 U.S. trading partners combined. Eleven manufacturing sectors have experienced growth of more than 50 percent since 1993. Of particular interest to this subcommittee, energy products have led the pack with over 250 percent growth. Most U.S. manufacturing se sectors, 36 out of 42, count Canada or Mexico as their top foreign market. Despite growth in manufacturing and a changing energy landscape has created a major need for new and improved energy delivery infrastructure. Investor-owned utilities alone expect to invest more than $300 billion over the next three years. ABB has been a participant in this manufacturing boom and has developed an integrated North American supply chain that supports our domestic manufacturing capabilities and operations. While much of the manufacturing of these technology happens domestically, many of our customers are domestic, certain parts of the manufacturing processes occur in Canada and Mexico, and many of the offerings produced in the U.S. are exported to customers in Canada and Mexico. I'd like to provide a few examples. ABB is the largest producer of power transformers in the world. These transformers can be found at power plants, manufacturing facilities, and in neighborhoods across the U.S. We build transformers at plants in Mississippi, Virginia, Missouri, and Tennessee. Yet the insulation material used as inputs into these transformers are sourced from a Canadian company. In Bartlesville, Oklahoma, ABB manufactures measurements and analytics products for the oil and gas sector. Our factory imports metal housings from a supplier in Mexico and electronic circuit boards from an ABB plant in Canada, which are both then incorporated into the final products manufactured in Oklahoma. Many of our U.S. factories also export to Canada and Mexico. For example, 50 percent of high-voltage surge arresters manufactured in Mount Pleasant, Pennsylvania, are sold to Mexico and Canada. ABB Sugarland, Texas facility supplies electric infrastructure control systems to Mexico's electric grid operator and Canadian power generation. Restrictions on trade or new barriers between the U.S., Canada, and Mexico, including on data transfer and digital solutions, would put up barriers too large markets in Canada and Mexico and could put upward price pressure on U.S. manufactured goods to all of our North American customers, <laughs> potentially making U.S.-made products less competitive and adversely affecting our domestic factories. In conclusion, ABB believe, believes the future of the U.S. economy is bright. This is particularly true in the energy sector. The integration of the three major North American economies has enhanced ABB's competitiveness, encouraged our investments in the United States, building on the North American Free Trade Agreement's legacy of economic growth and job creation. We can set the stage for further gains in these areas by modernizing the agreement in ways that eliminate remaining distortions and barriers, raise standards, strengthen neutral enforcement mechanisms, and remove unnecessary red tape at the border. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before the subcommittee today. I look forward to answering your questions. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you all for participating. And uh, at this point, we'll, we'll start our, our questions. I have to say at, at, at the onset that, boy, if there's anything that our constituents understand, it's gas prices. And, you know, back in uh, 2008, the average uh, 
gas at the pump was uh, 384 a gallon. Uh, today, I, or this, this last weekend, I saw it uh, uh, for 224, but I think uh, maybe it's a little bit higher in, in some of the areas of the country. But it's a pretty, uh, pretty dramatic uh, decline. Uh, and you know, as, as you think about what NAFTA has done and, and where we are, uh, as you pointed out in your testimony, Ms. Harbert, that uh, we've now been running a trade surplus with Canada and Mexico in refined petroleum and coal, and the trade deficit with these countries in oil and gas has been shrinking uh, rapidly. It's, it's in large part because we now really truly have a North American Energy Independent Plan that is, it is uh, coming to fruition, which is one of the reasons why these prices of energy have fallen, whether it be in LNG, whether it be uh, with the gas at the pump as well. Uh, you indicated at the end of your testimony that if NAFTA was uh, uh, changed uh, dramatically, it truly would threaten uh, our energy, not only our energy security, but I have to presume it would also dramatically uh, increase prices uh, to consumers as well. Can you, uh, can we explore that a little bit? Certainly. I mean, we have benefited from increased trade in North America and by lifting the oil export ban and increasing our LNG exports around the world, the American consumer and the American industry has, has benefited tremendously. Consumer prices have gone down by about 14 percent. And if that were to change, and for some way we would jeopardize either the certainty provided by NAFTA or the investor protections provided by NAFTA or even the reforms that have been undertaken in Mexico, that would threaten production in the United States because it could not find its natural markets. It would also uh, undermine current investments planned for Mexico, which would then bottle in some of our domestic capacity. So it's a lose-lose if we undermine NAFTA in any way that has been the basis for an incredible energy integration effort that is providing tremendous benefits to industry, consumers, to our national security as we are now getting more oil from them than from OPEC, and also obviously our energy security. Mr. Thompson, as we know, the, the Gulf Coast is home to the most technologically advanced refineries uh, in the world. Uh, many of us have been down there to, to see these advances. How has the uh, North American energy integration benefited the consumers uh, of these products, and what, what, uh, how, how might we strengthen as these negotiations are going on with the three countries? Now, what might you suggest to actually improve our situation in regard in regard to the technological technological improvements uh, that could be done. Well, thank you for the uh, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I'll just add that we have sophisticated facilities in far more than just Texas. We have uh, some in your fine state, and we yep. have them in 33 states. So this, you know, a strong energy sector uh, helps out most of the country. As far as you know, NAFTA goes, as we talked about it, it's pretty simple at its core. Uh, we got a lot of product from Canada, and we, we were able to sell a lot of finished goods to Mexico, and this is good for consumers. We get more than, you know, 40% uh, of all of our imports come from Canada, uh, and we get it, uh, you know, duty-free. So that, that means lower price for crew, which, which benefits the American consumer. As far as uh, additional protections, you know, we think that a more robust chapter in NAFTA dealing with energy, dealing with the uh, how it's developed and the modern way it's traded would, would benefit all. We certainly believe that we would benefit from having the three countries work together on infrastructure so we can uh, find the best ways to get uh, crude to our refineries and products to consumers in the most efficient way. So, Ms. Harbert, uh, you know, as, as we think back uh, to where we were back, particularly in, in the 70s, I mean, we've got the new abundance that's there now, the, developments in shale technology, all those different things. Uh, many of the laws and regulations were written back in those days when, when uh, we weren't exporters. Uh, what, what are some of the things, what are the, some of the things that we could do to prevent us uh, from being held back as it relates to uh, energy exploration and, and uh, increasing exports to not only to these two countries, but, uh, but to other countries around the world? Well, first, I think it's do no harm. Don't do anything to impair our ability to export to North America and beyond. Make sure that we can get those export facilities cited very quickly. We have to make sure that the regulatory process, and you guys have been working on this, is fair, transparent, and incorporates cost-benefit analyses. 
And last but not least, there is significant room for permitting reform, both within the country to move our products around more efficiently and also to export them to, to North America, both to Canada and to Mexico, and to import them as well. We've had a seven-year waging war on importing more oil from Canada. Uh, but we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that we have a tremendous opportunity to export our own natural gas, clean burning natural gas, to Mexico with some additional permitting reform. So both, I think, a laser-like focus in the upcoming debate on infrastructure in the Congress, who really need to take a very hard look at continuing reg reform and certainly permitting reform. Thank you. Mr. Rush. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Kootenay. I think it's Krupnik, right? Krup, yeah. Krup, sorry, Krupnik, yes. Krupnik, I'm sorry. In your written statement, you asked members to envision a world where the three North American countries act as a free trade energy bloc, which could rival every other nation or bloc in its ability to influence world markets for oil and gas. If we were to continue along the path we're currently on, with no changes to NAFTA and additional coordination, harmonization, and integration uh, between the U.S., Canada, and Mexico, how long do you envision it would take for uh, North America to truly rival a competitor like OPEC? Well, this is uh, this idea of a future energy block, uh, the United States, Canada, and Mexico operating as a unit, is uh, I think a useful exercise to think about the an ideal situation from an energy perspective. We're obviously I don't think ever going to head in that. Uh, we're heading in that direction, but we're never going to be there. Uh, we're not going to have an e an EU type structure with Mexico, Canada, and the United States. But I think it's useful for thinking about how to realize as many gains from trade and as many, um, uh, 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 as lowest possible uh, cost to industry of um, addressing environmental regulations, let's say, by harmonizing those regulations across countries so that there's sort of only one, one regulatory model that industry needs to uh, uh, address. So I think it's a useful paradigm. Uh, it's not something I see is actually going to happen uh, in my lifetime anyway. Thank you. Sure. Mr. Thompson, in your testimony, you noted that in 2016 alone, the U.S. exported $20.2 million worth of energy products to Mexico and imported $8.7 million worth of energy project products. How, in terms of jobs, how many U.S. energy jobs will potentially be impacted if the administration were to unilaterally make changes to NAFTA in a way that might upset our two trading partners and possibly hurt the mutually beneficial energy trade that we all can agree is uh, very notable? and profitable for all three countries. Well, thank you for the, thank you for the uh, question. Uh, we're optimistic that we're going to come through uh, with a, a modernized NAFTA and these negotiations are going to stay on track. Uh, we, we certainly are proud of our, uh, what, what our industry means from an employment perspective. As I said in my testimony, we support three million jobs, um, and those jobs are there because of our strong um, energy sector. And it, it certainly are going to be strengthened the more we work with our neighbors to the north and the south. Um, we believe that there's lots of opportunities in Mexico now that they have liberalized their energy network. And we already have a number of companies. Uh, we have uh, Endeavor and uh, Valero and ExxonMobil have entered the market, the downstream market in Mexico for the first time in many, many decades. Uh, we are supplying over half of their uh, gasoline needs, and that's going to continue to grow. And as that grows, it's going to strengthen um, our need for, for employment. Uh, I want to just ask uh, all the panelists, is there anyone on the panel who believes 
that we would benefit, our nation would benefit if the administration's uni administration unilaterally opens up negotiations on NAFTA and insists on establishing new terms that would be more beneficial to the U.S. Well, well we, to be clear, we, we certainly believe that, that NAFTA would, would benefit by being modernized. So we do think if modernized, it could, it could benefit the energy uh, industries we talked about. We believe that there could be a more, more, more robust chapter on energy and NAFTA. We believe that the United States should make sure uh, that you know, direct investors are protected, particularly now that Mexico has liberalized its energy uh, system. We think that a, a modernized NAFTA could do that. Uh, we think that uh, it could be enhanced to, to help us with regulatory cooperation with Mexico and Canada. So there are, um, Mr. Rush, lots of things that, that could be improved uh, through NAFTA modernization. We at the Chamber believe that withdrawal would be devastating to the U.S. economy. Uh, modernization is preferable. First, do no harm and then make it better. That's what modernization means. And that includes, from American business perspective, protect, making sure that we have those investment protections in place that ensure that we have uh, an ability to adjudicate our disputes fairly. So we need to stay in this game. I think we've all laid out, all the panelists have laid out the stakes. They're high. And we need to find a way to get to yes. Thank you. I just want to raise, there's more going on than just NAFTA, so we shouldn't lose sight of these other agreements that the administration is giving short shrift to or even walking away from on the environmental side. And from a North American manufacturer's and an ABB point of view, we support modernizing the agreement. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, you're back. Thank you. Mr. Barton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Ranking Member Rush for holding this hearing. Um, before I ask my questions, I want to thank uh, Karen Harbert for her help in passing the repeal of the ban on crude oil exports. You and the Chamber were, were big, big helps in that, and uh, we've exported as much as two million barrels a day in the last year, and I think we're about a million and a half barrels a day now. So, thank you and your organization for that. Um, I want to ask a little bit different question than Mr. Rush did, did, but it's it's basically the same thing. From reading your testimony and listening, my impression is that all of your organizations support staying in NAFTA in some way. Is that true? Is there anybody that advocates getting out of the NAFTA treaty? Okay, everybody's shaking their head, so we'll say that that's a no. Um, I'll ask um, Mr. Thompson, um, is, will there ever be a day when the U.S. refineries, which had really configured their, their, their uh, refineries uh, to use the heavier Mexican and Canadian crudes, that they will reconfigure to focus on the lighter uh, U.S. shale crudes? Um, well, I certainly couldn't say there'll never be a day, but right now I think they're configured in the most efficient way possible. As you know, oil is a, a global commodity, um, and the most efficient, you know, we're, we're, we're configured right now the most efficient that we can. The, the heavier crudes that uh, were designed to handle, we are handling, and the lighter stuff that can be better uh, processed is, is being exported. Um, and so can I say never? No, but I think right now we have a very efficient system that's operating uh, the way the global market dictates. Well, if, that, if that's the case, then we almost have to maintain some sort of a NAFTA arrangement to, because the, the Canadian and the Mexican crudes are the, the sour, more sour, heavier crudes. Is that not correct? That's correct. And, you know, um, I shook my head in agreement, but I'll say it out loud. Yes, we, we certainly and wholeheartedly agree that we should stay in NAFTA. This is a little bit off the NAFTA issue, but in that happy day, if it ever were to occur, that we would actually build an, a new U.S. refinery. And I know that's unlikely. I know we expand and modernize, but uh, if we were to actually, from scratch, build a, US, a, a new U.S. refinery, how would that refinery be configured? Would it still be configured for the heavier crudes that we import, or would it be 
configured to use the lighter crudes that apparently now we're exporting? Uh, I, you know, frankly, not in the best position to answer that. I think, you know, would people much smarter than me would, would design it in a way where they believe they'll have the best access to crude. Could it be re, uh, configured to handle the lighter stuff? Sure. Um, uh, but there's, there's arguments to, to handle the heavier stuff uh, as well. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll say on this point, you know, there's, you know, we have adequate refining capacity, you know, today to meet our domestic needs. Um, so, you know, right now there's no need to build a, an additional <laughs> refinery. Okay. Um, I'll ask Ms. Harbert, with the, I don't know how you exactly say it, but the, the Mexican uh, legislature and president have, have uh, changed their, their policy and uh, changed their laws to, so, to allow international companies uh, to own more and be more invested in Mexico. Uh, how is that going? Uh, are, are, well, and first let me thank you for your support and leadership in lifting the oil export ban, which has done a tremendous uh, benefit to the American economy. And the EIA estimated for 2018 we will, we will produce more oil than ever before in our nation's history. And obviously a lot of that will continue to be exports and particularly supplanting uh, oil from other countries that don't like us so much. You know, in Mexico it's happening and we have to congratulate the legislature and the president for being very courageous and doing something that took a long time to undo. And every major American company is down there with an office looking at how they can take advantage of this opportunity. Permits have been granted, infrastructure is being built. And, you know, to stop something right in the middle of its tracks of, of enjoying a boom of reinvesting back into Mexico would be tragic. Uh, there are companies that, uh, you know, have a lot of pent-up energy and a lot of pent-up demand for uh, realizing a better relationship with Mexico. So it's going great, uh, but it can only get better. And what we have to worry about is that a change in NAFTA or a change in leadership in Mexico that would jeopardize any of that, uh, certainly, you know, we would have to take that with a grain of salt, grain All of right. caution. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. McNerney. Well, I thank the Chairman. Thank the witnesses this morning. Uh, I'll start with Mr. Thompson. You mentioned that North America will be energy secure by the year 2020. Could you explain what that means exactly? What does ener energy security mean to you? Well, let me just say that that's not, uh, you know, uh, me saying that that's the International Energy Agency, the IEA, that's, that's saying it. And what that means is that we are uh, producing uh, a level of liquid fuels that satisfy our North American needs. So basically, we're, we are producing enough to satisfy our, need, our own needs, and we're not reliant on any other country for our energy needs. So we'd cut OPEC off, basically, from American, as an American. Well, we would, have the, we would have the potential to cut them off. Again, you know, it, whether the market would dictate that's another matter. But we could. We would be energy secure at that point. Do you disagree, Doctor? Uh, well, I just wanted to, to mention that, you know, oil is a, uh, a global market, and the prices, a price of oil is determined in a global market uh, in the absence of let's say, uh, Saudi Arabia's uh, cutting back its, um, its supply uh, uh, voluntarily or on its own to, uh, to change price. So we can never really be independent of other countries, uh, other producers, because, because we'll always be dependent through the price. But obviously, as our uh, oil demand falls and and our supply, domestic supply, grows. It does give us a greater measure of energy security. Well, you uh, you've been advocating for harmonization, um, Dr. Prucknick. But uh, just yesterday, we had a hearing on the CAFE standards. It's tremendously difficult to get harmonization within the United States itself. So, is there a pathway for us to reach harmonization with the other countries? Well, at, at initially, I would just hope that we could. Um, get behind the agreements that we already had with other, with uh, Canada and Mexico. Uh, the ones I mentioned were on environmental issues. Um, there's a, a, an agreement with Mexico and the United States to jointly inspect uh, facilities in the deep water of the Gulf of Mexico to make sure that they're uh, living up to the uh, safety standards that both countries are enforcing. So I think there's a lot that can be done uh, uh, bilaterally and, 
and trilaterally. Well, you mentioned that uh, pulling out of the Paris conference, I think I understood you to m mention or imply that that hurt the confidence of investors. Uh, could you expand that a little bit? Uh, I don't know if I exactly said it that way, but um, I think what we're seeing is that companies uh, around, the, around the world and international companies that are located and based in the United States, plus companies in the United States are already using uh, what we would call uh, as economists shadow prices of carbon, that is internal prices of carbon to help in their investment planning. So whether we pull out of the Par Paris Accords or not, companies can't afford not to, to bet on a future without climate legislation in the United States. So they have to take the long view with investments, let's say, in pipelines lasting 40 years. They've got to take the long view in their investment decisions about what's going to happen to climate policy uh, in the future, in the U.S. and around the world. And they're doing that irrespective of whether we're currently in the Paris Accords or not. Um, one last question. Uh, you said that the Congress could help promote renewable capacity using local resources. Uh, could you expand on that a little bit as well? Yeah, so um, I'm, I'm not in Congress. I don't know the levers that you all have to, to, uh, to use. Some of it is just moral suasion. To, to, uh, some of it is, as I'm sure, is passing bills. But uh, Mexico is, a, uh, uh, ha is blessed with very good solar energy. And Canada has a lot of unexploited hydroelectric uh, energy. So the United States could benefit, and, these, and Mexico and Canada could benefit by taking advantage of these locational advantages that these countries have to have our electricity be uh, uh, cheaper for American consumers. And these can be cost competitive with traditional fuels? Uh, well, uh, they can be. Certainly in the hydro front, uh, they can be, and, uh, and potentially in Mexico, kind of better than having solar in Mexico than having solar in uh, um, Massachusetts. New England. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Mr. Olson. I thank the chair and welcome to our four witnesses with a special Texas welcome to Secretary Harbert. Ma'am, you and I share a common bond. We are both Rice Owls, Jones 85. Welcome. There we go. Well, Jones beats Hans and all the sports that matter, so you get a welcome. Also welcome to Mr. Burchett. As you know, sir, ABB has a presence there in Sugarland, Texas, as you mentioned. Please come down and visit. You'll love to see the facility. It's amazing. Also, right around the corner is a restaurant called the uh, Live Oak, the best burgers in Fort Bend County, right there at Live Oak, right by ABB in Sugarland, Texas. And this is no news, but North American energy trade is vital to the world's economy. Heavier crew from Canada is a critical part of the American refining space. We all know that the Eagle Fruit Shale does not stop at the Rio Grande waiting for a visa to cross. And we know that as Mexico improves its energy sector, our ties with our neighbor will only grow stronger. And make no mistake, we're on the verge of replacing OPEC with a de facto NAPEC. North American petroleum exporting countries. And of course, my home state of Texas ties to Mexico are also important for electricity. They have been invaluable to ERCOT in our electricity market. For example, in August of 2011, my state was hit with a statewide heat wave over 100 degrees on every square inch of our state for the entire month of August. That put us in a situation of some rolling blackouts. Mexico sent power across the river to help us out. Over 200,000 homes were powered by energy, electricity from Mexico. It's an important relationship for Texas and America to have. My first question is for you, Mr. Burchett. In your written testimony, you talked about how one electric transformer comes together from sites all across North America. And that's a great example of how trade works in energy. Can you discuss how trade deals like NAFTA make that possible 
And what would happen if the global supply chain, if it spikes with tariffs? Thank you, Congressman Olson. And, and by the way, my office is in Houston, Texas, so I do get to Sugar Land quite often. So, yeah, Member, we'll the Live Oak. Live Oak. Got it. So ABB is a, you know, so we're a multinational, multi-billion uh, dollar company, and, and we look at, we make investments all the time. What drives those investments is consistency, stability, low trade barriers. And so when, I, when, when we think of NAFTA, that helps drive those types of investment because we have the consistency and the stability that's provided there. Okay. Ms. Harbert, question for you in the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. You were pretty clear in your testimony that our chamber never, ever wants to see America walk away from NAFTA. And our local five-star chamber of commerce in Sugarland, the Fort Bend Chamber of Commerce, led by Kerry Schmidt, repeats that message to me every single time we meet at home. With that said, are there items that could be included if, in negotiations which would hamstring the agreement, even if we stayed part of it? To put it here in D.C. terms, is there a poison pill that's possible that looks benign that can bring the whole structure down? Well, and thank you for, for your kind comments, and I'll try and get the Hanson Athletics to uh, step it up a little bit. No beer bite. <laughs> um, you know, I'm glad to see that the echo chamber is working because the business community is united in its support of NAFTA, modernization, not withdrawal, and protection of those parts of NAFTA that are very important to the business community, specifically the investor protections that are in there. If those were taken out, I think American industry would have a very, very large problem in agreeing with the future terms of NAFTA. There are lots of things that could be done to improve it, but that would be one that would be very difficult. And if we were to then see that go away and then we would have steep tariffs, you can know what would happen to the American consumer here. So we have our eyes laser-like focused on the investor protections to make sure they are included. Well, thanks for that about our time. And Mr. Chairman, again, welcome to witnesses. Merry Christmas. I yield back the balance of my time. Mr. Peters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to the witnesses for being here. Ms. Harbert, we saw each other last time. It was probably 80 degrees where we were, and not that way today. Um, thanks for being here. Uh, just a couple uh, observations. First of all, there's a lot to like about energy abundance uh, for consumers, for manufacturing. Um, and it's also, even if, if our uh, friends to the north and the south, Mexico and Canada, even if we don't act like OPEC, it's still advantageous to have friendly uh, countries to trade with for energy. Another, uh, uh, another observation is this really has been about um, petroleum and hydrocarbons, not just not all energy trade. We haven't talked about next generation nuclear or um, renewables. That's also part of the discussion. But just focused on what we've covered here, it does strike me as with all this abundance, an odd time to be opening up. Alaska to offshore drilling. I don't see the need for that. Uh, a tax discuss is part of a tax bill, a part of a tax bill that didn't even ever discuss the $2 billion of subsidy we provide at a time of all this abundance. And then at the same time, we're talking about depleting the Strategic Petroleum Reserve at, at prices that almost couldn't be lower. It doesn't seem like it's very smart. Um, uh, I observe that as part of the context. And uh, Ms. Harbert, um, I, I'm with you on regulatory reform and permitting reform. Actually, in my previous life, I was I represented a lot of clients who tried to get through government processes that could be very, very frustrating. I believe we can achieve high environmental standards with less drag on the economy. would like to work with you on that. Along those lines, one thing I'd point out um, is what's happening around methane right now. Um, I think I saw today that the American Petroleum Institute and this is great news, started its own business partnership to deal with reducing VOCs and methane. They are probably observing what I'm observing is that these rules are becoming politicized. And that's bad for business because what's going to happen is you could get this back and forth. Uh, if, the pre if, the pre every if the president wants to undo everything because it's got Obama's name on it, well, that's not good for business either. So I, I congratulate the American Petroleum Institute. I know the chamber is interested in certainty we can have good methane rules that protect us uh, in the environment and are certain for business. I'd like to work with you on that. Um, and I'm with you on NAFTA. Uh, for me in San Diego, uh, one of the most important parts of our economy is our trade with Mexico. Our relationship with Mexico is very important to us. Um, I'm a supporter of President Obama's TPP negotiations. 
Again, uh, the business community seems united behind this. I don't particularly, I can't speak for all the Democrats here, but I understand the need for uh, dispute resolution that's free from some of the um, hometowning, particularly in developing nations. I think that makes a lot of sense. Maybe we should just uh, rename, rename it the Trump Pacific Partnership and be on with it, maybe get a vote on it that way. Uh, but what I did want to just say, it, it, uh, because a lot of this has been covered, um, I heard mostly discussion in terms of modernizing about leaving it the same, making sure that we preserve dispute resolution, make sure that we, don't, we do no harm. I just wanted to give you an opportunity. Uh, uh, I think we've been asked this before. Are there any specific changes you'd like to see in terms of modernization that we should be asking for? And Mr. Burchett, I'll start with you. Thank you, Congressman. There are more experts than I on NAFTA agreement. I know in my career, I remember when it started and I was doing business in Mexico, it's been 23 years. Um, so I would defer to the experts on, on NAFTA for the modernization, but it just seems to me that given the, given the changes that's happened in the 23 yeah. years, given the shale gas revolution, given the, the high tech things that we do now, like, like the refineries that were mentioned by, by uh, Congressman Upton, which is ABB technology, uh, and given the level of trade that I see with our 50 manufacturing plants and, and a, a, a nice footprint in Canada also of manufacturing and a nice footprint in Mexico, uh, it seems time to modernize. Yep. Anything? I have Harper? a couple of very specific things that a new NAFTA would ensure that the cross-border trade of crude oil, natural gas, and refined product wouldn't be subject to any quantitative measures or tariffs. Uh, secondly, that we could more safely or more quickly develop uh, safe cross-border interconnections of electricity and hydrocarbons. And lastly, or there's two more. We really need to look at and prohibit local content rules uh, that the industry could not meet, and we should take a hard look at some common standards and regulations, not all, uh, where it makes sense in the energy sector so we can more harmonize, which is a scary word to our friends in the North. They don't right. like that word, but we could find some commonality. Okay. That's very constructive. Uh, Dr. Krupnik, anything you want to add real briefly? Uh, no, I think this has been pretty well covered. Okay. I really appreciate uh, you looking. I look forward to working with you to see if we can't say what's good and make it better. And, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Mr. Shimkus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate uh, my colleague from California's questions. I, I've got a just a picture should go up on the screen. And, and I was trying to find another one, but really that just gives you, you know, either pipelines, crude oil crossings, and sometimes they don't show going into Mexico, but there's a little, like a dot where the crossing location is for um, crude, for refined product, for hydrocarbon gas liquids, uh, for natural gas, and for electric transmission. So I think what, what, what we struggle with is those of us who've been on the committee, which is one of the reasons why I love the committees, we're, we're interconnected. We're, we're there. We've been there for a long time. We're going to continue to have this. So... Uh, the, why I think the hearing is important is, and uh, Ms. Haber, you just raised some of the issues of the concerns that if there's a pullout of NAFTA, what damage do you do to that interconnected North American grid or North American crude oil or, uh, or refined product lines? Anyone want to mention that real quick? Well, looking at your map, if you can imagine in a, in a world without NAFTA, anything that would be coming into the yeah, for example, to Texas, uh, if you know electricity, if there was going to be a toll or a tariff put on there that we would have higher prices than we actually, you know, charge in America, that would be a huge disincentive for our energy security because we depend on this, as you well pointed out. And if we change that economic equation, uh, that's going to raise prices here at home, and we're going to have to search for other suppliers. And right now, there's uncertainty because of conflicting messages out. So I'm from Southern Illinois. Um, we're pork and beans and um, corn. Uh, uh, NAFTA is very, very important for my commodity-based products. But we also have the fear every small town in America really has that small manufacturing facility that's moved. So that's the conflict of NAFTA for members. Um, in fact, not to point out ABB, but they announced the closure of the St. Louis plant, a transformer manufacturing. I don't know where it's going, but I do know I drive by it every day when I go to the airport. So... That's the struggle with how do you renegotiate while keeping the, the benefits of that or for my corn to be sold where you're ensuring that our manufacturing sector is equally treated because we can't negotiate 
wages. We can't negotiate environmental standards. Well, maybe some people think we can, but historically, those are things left to the individual country to, to be able to do. Uh, anyone want to comment on that, um, those challenges? I could say something about the map, and one thing it's not on the map. Um, so there are a number of pipeline, uh, there's a lot of plans to grow the number of pipelines coming into Mexico to meet that rising uh, natural gas demand. So those could be put in jeopardy. And then on, in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, the lease sale, lease sale one, uh, round one was completed, two is almost completed. Uh, three is supposedly going to get into deep water, and that could be held up. Right. Uh, so it could put us and, and of course, indirectly the, uh, the Mexicans at risk as well. And for those who followed the committee and what I've done in public statements, comments, uh, Keystone Pipeline, Keystone XL, which uh, feeds right, obviously, from the, the uh, oil sands all the way down to my district. It was a big terminal there, and then it spreads throughout all the Midwest. So, and we've seen <laughs> not just an international negotiation, but we've seen obviously just internal politics delay pipeline construction. Mr. Thompson. Yeah, so let me just say I can, I can say with certainty that my refining facilities are the most efficient in the world, and we're not relocating anywhere, you know, under NAFTA. We're going to be there, uh, but you know, as our Transportation demand for fuel flattens out. Our facilities need export markets to right. continue to grow. I think that's prosper. a good point. And I was going to jump on that with the last 40 seconds. Just for the liquid transportation fuels debate, um, we, had, we had that hearing yesterday on CAFE and greenhouse gas and the, the debate of uh, EV penetration. Now, it's not huge across the country, but electric vehicle penetration in California is noticeable. And international comments about uh, like Norway and France who are trying to make or China, that really will dis could disrupt this market, uh, crude oil and refined products, don't you think? It certainly uh, EV penetration could indeed, yes, it would could be very disruptive. So we need to keep the liquid transportation market. We need to keep the liquid tra transportation market strong. Thank you. Thank you very much. I yield back, Mr. Lobsack. Oh, I'm sorry. He left. Mr. Tonko. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, welcome, witnesses. Uh, one area where our energy sector is undeniably and quite literally in interconnected is the United States and Canadian electrical grid systems. In 2016, the U.S. imported 73.1 million megawatt hours of electricity from Canada, about a quarter of which went to New York State, my home state. Dr. Krupnik, do the interconnections between the United States and Canadian power systems improve grid reliability on both sides of the border? Uh, well, sure. The short answer to that is yes. Um, for To maximize this, the benefits of cross-border electricity trade, what we have a report that talks about, about what to do there are several margins to increase reliability, and one of them is to have capacity planning be a joint exercise mm -hmm. uh, between, um, let's say, control areas in the United States and and uh, uh, and in in uh, Canada. So, thank so you. So that's not. Uh, there's a lot of things that we can do beyond what we're doing. Thank you. And the Canadian hydropower is becoming increasingly important for New York State's plan to meet its clean energy targets. So I see big potential for increased renewable electricity trade, such as the importation of Canadian hydro, which will reduce emissions in our country. But these projects rely on cross-border transmission uh, infrastructure. What unique challenges exist to siting, permitting, and constructing cross-border transmission compared to domestic transmission projects? Well, I can take a stab at that. Um, you know, you're absolutely right. The provision of Canadian electricity to the Northeast more broadly is hugely important for grid reliability. The Northeast suffered a, a very devastating blackout in the early 2000s, and from that was established the North, uh, the, the Electricity Reliability Coordination Council, uh, which seeks to look at these things and manage the grid up there more responsibly. And so that's an important new organization that helps us to do that. 
cross-border is still hard, and it takes approvals from both sides of the of the border. Sometimes it's a state and local, hmm. um, because it's not just going crossing the border. It's going through other uh, municipalities and counties that might not be excited about having a new transmission line. And so we really need to take a look at the redundancy of federal, state, and local permitting so that we get things built in a, in a predictable time frame. Thank you. Anyone else want to respond yes. to that? Yeah. So as ABB, we invented high voltage DC transmission, which is the way you do a lot of these interconnections. So we do them all over the world. We're working on one with Denmark and UK now. One of the biggest ones in for, is for New England and, for, and uh, is to get the power from Canada there. So in talking to our customers, I've heard the, the, them describe the regulatory approval process as quote unquote a game of shoots and ladders that can take seven to 10 years. Mm -hmm. And so what they would, you know, what I, of course they would like to see an expedited process, but the technology is there uh, to get particularly hydroelectric power from Canada into New England. Thank you. Um, yesterday marked the second day anniversary of Paris Climate Agreement. 197 parties have signed the Paris Agreement and 170 parties have ratified it. The United States is the only country with the intention to withdraw. Progress in North American and global emissions reductions will be hindered by the absence of our leadership, United States leadership. But we have seen no indication that our neighbors intend to back away from their Paris commitments or their carbon pricing policies. So, Dr. Krupnik, do you believe it will be more difficult for the United States, Canada, and Mexico to cooperate on cross-border energy and environmental policy harmonization if the United States continues to be disengaged on global action on climate change? Um, I, the answer is yes, of course, it'll be more difficult. Uh, and as I've tried to indicate, they're still at a, at a state level, uh, at a regional level, there are still opportunities for that kind of engagement, let's say that we're seeing from California with Quebec, Ontario, Manitoba, and so on in their CO2 trading program. So it's not like um, all these interactions are going to stop but uh, of course we'll be, uh, we'll be hurt in our ability to negotiate further. Right, and so the consequences I believe are probably that there, we would be less likely to align their policies with ours and, and are there limits then to opportunities to lower costs to businesses and consumers? Uh, yes, anytime you, you put barriers uh, into a cooperation interaction, you're going to create increased costs somewhere along the line. Yeah. Um, with that, I, I thank you and yield back. The gentleman is back. The chair now call, calls upon the gentleman from West Virginia, Mr. McKinley, for five minutes. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in our uh, uh, binding or our majority, uh, memorandum uh, binder, we said, uh, I read that we have, uh, apparently we have 73 gigawatts of electricity are being imported from Canada uh, currently. Um, for everyone to understand, that's the equivalent of anywhere between 70 and 120 power plants. Um, so I'd like to focus on those implications, if I could, for with, with this panel. Uh, because currently, <clears throat> first is currently under, con under construction is a Lake Erie connector. Uh, and that's a thousand megawatt high voltage underwater transmission line that would provide the first direct link between Ontario power generators and the America PJM. Uh, this will enable, this uh, uh, Lake Erie connector will enable a subsidized Canadian power companies to compete with American private sector energy producers. Secondly, the Quebec electricity sector is dominated by Canada's largest utility, and it's a state-owned and, and operated monopoly, which is heavily subsidized. According to CBC News reports, Canadian electricity producers are generating more power than they consume and sell off excess power to the United States at rates below the cost of production, close quote. Now, this unfair competition may result in lower utility bills for us in America, but this outsourcing of our electric generation costs American jobs and lost state and local tax revenue. Therefore, I'm concerned that the U.S. markets are becoming the dumping ground 
for Canadian state subsidized electricity, much like we become the dumping ground for cheap subsidized steel from China. So my concerns, the Canadian government subsidizes electric exports to the United States, the government dumps electricity at a low, below rate, and it results in lost jobs and the state revenue. So my question, perhaps it's to you, Ms. Harbert, should the new NAFTA negotiations, and I would encourage those negotiations to take place, address this unfair market distortion? Sure, and one thing to point out, when we negotiated NAFTA the first time around, energy wasn't even part of the equation. Uh, we didn't know how much we had, Canada had, Mexico had. We didn't anticipate the fully integrated energy economy we, we have today. So, you know, as we proceed in the fifth and sixth and hopefully uh -huh. conclusion of this, there are issues like that that should be discussed. But at the same time, we also have to realize that in the Pacific Northwest of our country, we are exporting a tremendous amount of hydropower up into Canada. Uh, and some of those are from government-owned facilities as well. Uh, back to the, you know, the TVA days and all of that. So, you know, it's something that should be looked at. That is not particularly my exact area of expertise, but I think it should be talked about. But it probably flows on both sides of the border that we would have to consider that the equation. Anyone else on the panel have comments about the subsidization? Sure. I think uh, subsidies uh, to renewables, subsidies to fossil fuels, uh, anywhere you see subsidies, uh, there's a case for eliminating them. All that, that I think is important is that if we're eliminating subsidies on one type of fuel, we should eliminate them on others as well. And uh, so if Canada is subsidizing their hydro, then that's an issue that should be taken up. Thompson, any, any comments? Well, this is certainly out, out of you know, my area of expertise, but I will say that speaks more broadly to, to the reasons that we need a, a separate, more complex title, NAFTA, dealing with the energy issues. As <coughs> Karen said, we, we need to, at the time NAFTA, when it was originally developed, these issues weren't in front of us, and we need to. Cause okay, because according to these same reports, they're saying that we're ultimately going to be a net importer of electricity uh, at the PJM from Canada. Uh, so I'm, I'm interested to know whether or not something like this in NAFTA agreement should allow for some kind of cost recovery or tariff, if I, if I use that, the T word. Any thoughts? No, as, a, as a final statement, I would, for, from an ABV standpoint, we're a technology provider. So we do the high tech. And what I'll tell you about those interconnects is the power can flow both ways. So I don't know what the potential there is in the future or how, you know, from a subsidy standpoint, I have no point of view, but I know the technology can go both ways. Okay, I yield back. The gentleman is back. The chair now calls upon the gentleman from the same home state as our chairman who wants me to say publicly, I recognize that Michigan beat Texas in basketball yesterday, 57 to 52. Mr. Wahlberg, you have five minutes. With that kind introduction, Mr. Uh, Chairman, I won't add anything to it. Great basketball game, though. Thank you. Um, Ms. Harbert, uh, thank you for being here, and thanks to each of the panel members for being here. Uh, many people um, uh, think energy, and they think oil and gas. Um, what other industries benefit from North American energy trade? Well, I like to say that every one of our 50 states is in the energy business. You may not be producing it, but you're in the supply chain, and obviously we are all consumers. So uh, with a more integrated North American energy market, all of our consumers, our families are benefiting, our industries are profiting, or not profiting, but are benefiting from lower prices. And let's not forget that uh, industries have moved back to America. The fertilizer industry is back, uh, helping your pork and beans and et cetera and corn. Uh, the petrochemical industry is back in the Gulf that was used to be in the Middle East. Uh, the steel industry is back in some form or fashion in Pennsylvania, Ohio. <laughs> so manufacturing is back and critical inputs to our manufacturing are back. So it is an energy revolution in all 50 states. And I think that's important uh, for us to, uh, to get out very clearly. Uh, we often think of energy in, in combative terms at times that it's not in my backyard. Uh, and the impact is sometimes forgotten as well. So um, uh, for us here in Congress and policy to think along those lines, but also the industries to make sure that we broadcast it, uh, assist, uh, assist in the long, long haul. 
Ms. Harbert, uh, the, the low uh, cost of natural gas and electricity is driving a revival in U.S. manufacturing and providing our economy with uh, a competitive advantage. However, uh, free trade and market principles also allow producers of energy commodities such as natural gas and LNG to export their commodity abroad. Uh, how do we strike the right balance so that everybody, including U.S. consumers, can reap the positive economic benefits? Well, natural gas is a real great story for America. We're producing more natural gas than we can consume. And in order to continue to produce at that level, they need export markets. And that's what guarantees lower prices in those industries that are coming back. Uh, we have additional capacity being planned into Mexico uh, that will be good because Mexico will then stimulate additional demand for our natural gas by developing new industries and new consumers. So having more than we consume is a good thing. Uh, they're not going to sell it at the expense of domestic producers because every or domestic uh, industry, they're getting all that they need. But in order to keep those prices low for that domestic industry, we want to be able to export. Okay, not a zero sum game then. No. Okay, uh, Dr. Kripnik. Uh, there are during the debate over LNG licensing for export, there were many studies done. Uh, on what the effect of those exports of natural gas would be on U.S. domestic prices. And uh, uh, the, the best ones of those clearly said that there would be very little effect on prices. We have, uh, with the shale gas revolution, we have such rapid uh, response ability now in the fields to even small changes in prices uh, with increased supply that um, we're, in a, we're in a new era. And I don't think we have to worry about uh, increased exports of our natural gas. Thank you. Um, Mr. Thompson, uh, what types of opportunities are opening up for American companies with Mexico's energy reforms? And uh, we often talk about hydrocarbons, but what about electricity? Well, um, I can't speak to the electricity side. That's not what my members do. Uh, but I can speak to with the opening up of the liberalization of their downstream sector. We have a number of companies that are now entering the uh, Mexican market. Uh, we had uh, Andiver uh, has opened up the first Arco station in uh, Mexico, and the, they're supplying fuel from their refinery in the state of Washington. Uh, we have Valero now has entered into agreements to provide products, ExxonMobil, BP, uh, Chevron. So we have a lot of U.S. companies now that are entering Mexico to uh, supply needed fuel to, to the Mexican economy. Okay. Thank you. And, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair now calls upon the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Latta, for five minutes. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you very much for our panel today. You know, if I could follow up on my friend from uh, Michigan, uh, uh, Ms. Harbert, uh, we were talking about the shale revolution because, of course, in Ohio, what we've seen happen on the, our eastern side of the state and also in uh, western Pennsylvania when you look at the Utica and the Marcellus uh, shale, that uh, it has created a uh, revolution out there with wide-ranging uh, benefits to the economy. And, when, you know, when you're looking at uh, the creation of millions of jobs at a time when, we're, you know, things are struggling out there, but uh, overall, how has the consumer benefited from this revolution that we've seen out there right here at home? Well, it's an American supply chain uh, that has jumped in and fulfilled uh, we're making new products to fuel that revolution, which means more jobs. And for the American consumer, prices are low, no na low natural grass prices here have saved the American family money. Over the last six years, prices have gone down by about 14 percent for energy for a family, uh, which provides additional purchasing power, which stimulates the economy. You know, in addition, if we were able to uh, get more pipeline capacity out of the Marcellus and into the Northeast, uh, those consumers up there would benefit from, from low natural gas prices as well. So it's, it's jobs, it's new industries, it's low prices. And we're being more competitive with our exports overseas because our prices are two to four times lower than they are in Europe, uh, which is a good thing. So we're more competitive on the global stage because of these low prices. Yeah, well, thank you very much. And uh, uh, Mr. Birchett, uh, our, elect our electrical uh, systems are evolving rapidly with the technological innovation and regulatory policies uh, that's driving the change. In your view, what does the grid of the future need to look like in order to deliver electricity more efficiency and more cost effectively? So when we think of the future grid, as we're working with most of the investor-owned utilities and, and uh, it, our customers, I mean, it's 
we know the words reliable are there. We know we know the words renewable are there. But we also, when we look at power generation, uh, we view it as an all of the above situation where it, our future does have solar, wind, but also coal, nuclear, traditional generation. Uh, if you look at studies from EIA out for the next 30, 40 years, you still see all the different fuel elements in play. But the technology in play is more around the distribution grid and the automation and being able to fully automate the grid so that when an occurrence occurs, you get the, the interruption and the restor restoration of power happens almost immediately. So, well, Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Thompson, uh, with the huge increase in domestic production, uh, our imports have, you know, fallen dramatically, as has been being discussed. We've cut OPEC imports in half in less than a decade. How has our energy security situation changed as a result of the North American energy trade? Well, thank you for the question. So, as, you know, you noted, our, our domestic production is near all-time highs. Um, and, you know, so we, we are, you know, more energy secure than we have been in, in quite some time. Now, that certainly hasn't eliminated our need to, uh, to import crude into our country, and that's more because of, you know, our facilities are configured to handle the heavier crudes. Uh, so we're able to take our lighter uh, crudes and export them to facilities that are better uh, designed and equipped to handle those. And, but we've been able to get more of our crude from our, you know, friends uh, up north in Canada. And 41% uh, of all of our imports come from Canada, and that's a good thing. And as the IEA said, that we're on track here as a North America to be energy secure by 2020. Well, thank you very much. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The chair now calls upon the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Kinzinger, for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I know there's a, based off the last question, uh, I do want to make the point that I think, you know, energy security is essential, not just you know, for economy, which is great, obviously, and important, but also because uh, a lot of foreign actors use energy as a weapon. And, uh, and I think it's essential to, to note that, you know, if the West is ever going to fight back against some of the, uh, the policies of the East or Russia, it's essential that we have a very strong uh, energy platform to do so because the Russians in many case use, cases use um, energy as a, as a weapon to try to extract political favors from foreign actors and uh, foreign governments. I think that's an essential point to note. Uh, Ms. Harbour, since NAFTA was originally negotiated, Mexico has instituted a number of reforms, uh, including opening its uh, energy markets. What do these reforms mean for uh, consumers in our country? First of all, I just want to underscore what you just said, which is the NAFTA security dividend of our energy revolution is enormous, that we are able to provide uh, exports to allies who have been forced into choosing a single source for their oil or for their natural gas. So providing that choice provides great national security for them and for us, providing choice. Uh, the opening up the, of the, uh, or the reform of the hydrocarbon sector in Mexico, uh, which took a very long time and uh, some courageous political actors to do, has, has been an open invitation for American companies because they did the reform right and they're continuing to improve it. And so we've already had several lease sales there and there's one that's going into the deep water and our companies that have the best best technology around are going to be the ones bidding on it. So that, from an environmental standpoint, is very important. Uh, but also, as we have more of our all of our resources flowing across borders in North America, which makes that energy market more efficient, it keeps prices low. Electricity prices, fuel prices, natural gas prices, and it's stimulating that manufacturing revolution that's putting more Americans back to work. And so you mentioned a little bit about, you know, future bids and technology. What are new opportunities that you see to engage Mexico's energy sector further? Well, they're sort of threefold at the moment, and all of them are ongoing and in rapid fire, which is uh, cross-border electricity, which has we've, – we've had that for a while, but now there's a lot more demand on the Mexico side, so more interconnected electricity. Natural gas, we have a lot of American companies that are building pipeline right now, uh, right at the border, ready to go across, and that will stimulate more demand for our products uh, under NAFTA because they will have a more bigger middle class that can purchase our products. And then there's offshore which I think between the North Sea and the Gulf of Mexico, those are the m most advanced companies ever. So we should take great comfort, and that is our companies that will be investing in the Gulf of Mexico in these tricky, you know, deep shore. And wh what can water. we do to ensure that the renegotiations won't have adverse consequences on our uh, energy industry? 
Well, one of the most critical things that we are looking at is the, inve the investor protections uh, that have been provided for and need to be maintained. So the Mexican energy economy is reformed. That's bred investment. Investment likes some certainty. And so two things could upend that, which would be uh, a withdrawal from NAFTA. Mm -hmm. Uh, or something that jeopardizes the uh, an AFTA that does not have the investor protections. And so we as the business community are united and those investor protections need to be maintained in any type of modernized NAFTA. Okay. Uh, Mr. Burkett or Burchett, I'm not sure. Uh, in your testimony, you provide examples of how ABB's supply chain spans North America, including supporting a number of manufacturing sites in the U.S. As you say, the U.S., Canada, and Mexico do not simply trade with each other. We build things together and rely on each other's markets to support millions of jobs. How can we ensure uh, that NAFTA renegotiations won't have adverse consequences on ABB and similar U.S. manufacturers that have robust trade cooperation through North America as a central part of their business? Yeah, that's, you know, that's from an ABB perspective. From, a, from the National Association of Manufacturers, we're also now talking 14,000 small, medium, and large businesses that, you know, have similar levels of integration with Canada and Mexico, right? So when, and quite simply, when we look at what needs to happen, it's, it, it, for, for manufacturers, uh, we obviously do a lot of investment. So the consistency, the stability, the lack of volatility allows us to, to, uh, to make those investments in these low trade barriers. So it's, it's pretty simple formula for us. And, and the investment likes consistency. Yep. Uh, and with my 20 seconds left, I'll yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for being here. The gentleman yields back. The chair now calls upon the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Duncan, for five minutes. Because if you think about Canada and Mexico, when you think about uh, the energy renaissance in this country and our ability to export an abundant natural gas uh, through LNG, then you think about the needs in this hemisphere. You think about the Caribbean nations that are reliant on Venezuela and the Venezuelan situation. That's opportunity for Americans and American businesses in the oil and gas industry. Um, but there are other opportunities where American technology can be exported. And we think about energy exports, but just think about products. But we have fracking technology and other um, downhole technology that can be utilized offshore, say, Guyana, which just discovered a tremendous oil field, 32 trillion cubic feet of natural gas, not counting the oil. I don't have that number right off the top of my head. But it's an abundant time. And think about sea salt uh, fines uh, off the coast of Brazil. American technology, both onshore and offshore, can be exported within this hemisphere. So I want to ask Ms. Uh, Ms. Harbert, uh, because she seems to have a lot of knowledge about global uh, energy initiatives. What are other opportunities that American industries can take advantage of? Because we are a leader um, in the energy area. 
Well, you're absolutely right. And the countries uh, in Latin America, save Venezuela, uh, Argentina, Peru, Brazil, they have welcomed American investment in the energy sector because they know we have the best technology and the best techniques available. Uh, we've been able to develop gas in Peru. We've been able to, with some hiccups along the way, be big investors in Argentina. And the demand in Latin America as a developing world is going to go up. And so the opportunities for us to invest in some of those repositories in Latin America, but also to export from America, is huge, uh, just like it is in Africa. Uh, Africa is going to be an industrializing part of the world, and we want to be part of that industrialization through energy as a foundation for it. They don't have all the energy we need. So so the opportunities, if you look at the International Energy Agency forecast, the demand for fossil fuels not only is constant but goes up, and we will provide fossil fuels, we'll provide 80 percent of all the, the world's energy resources in 2050. So huge opportunities to export way beyond just North America. Yes, we, we have the capability to take crude from all around the world. And most importantly, you know, we look forward to the opportunity to export products uh, back to the rest of the world. You know, last year we exported 70, you know, 2 billion gallons. And with the U.S. energy or uh, transportation fuel demand staying relatively flat, now we need those export markets. The chair, thanks the gentleman, and you yield back. The chair now calls upon the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Flores, for five minutes. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate you holding this hearing, and I appreciate the panel for joining us today. Uh, when NAFTA was negotiated, Mexico's uh, energy sector was largely closed to foreign investment. Uh, this is important to me because I was a, one of my firms did a substantial Uh, advantage of that market opening, uh, U.S. companies need to have the certainty that their investments will be protected uh, from against government mistreatment. The NAFTA renegotiation presents an opportunity to recognize Mexico's energy reforms and to maintain and strengthen uh, NAFTA's investment protections. Uh, and this is why it's important. Mexico's the number one export definition, excuse me, destination for U.S. gas exports, making up 60 percent of Mexico's total gas supply. Most of that gas comes from my home state of Texas. Mexico is also the number one export destination for U.S. petroleum products. Half the gasoline U.S. refiners exported, exported this year went to Mexico. And energy and production activity offshore Mexico is just starting as well, creating new opportunities for U.S. businesses. Uh, many of folks, uh, folks that are friends of mine that I used to do business with when I was in the energy business. Um, it's my understanding that the U.S excuse me, that the White House and USTR are supportive of locking in these energy reforms, as is Mexico. Unfortunately, there are proposals in the NAFTA renegotiation that would undercut, if not eviscerate, in, uh, important investment protections in NAFTA, uh, typically via the well-recognized ISDS mechanism. So in light of the foregoing, here are my questions. Uh, Ms. Harbert, I believe that you touched on the importance of investment protection via the ISDS mechanism in your written testimony. Will you please comment on the USTR, USTR's proposal to scale back investment protection, particularly the consequences for the energy sector? Mr. Thompson, I'll ask you the same thing. Thank you for the opportunity. You're absolutely right. Anything from the U.S. side that would seek to upend the certainty that is necessary to continue the investments brought about by the reform are certainly unwelcome. And I think they would have the following uh, repercussions. Number one, it would jeopardize that American investment, and that's what we're actually trying to protect. We would also jeopardize North American energy security. Without having that free cross-border trade, we wouldn't have the benefit of both the import and export of energy from both of our trading partners, which would be 
uh, a big setback to energy security. We would also jeopardize North America becoming the center of gravity of the world's energy market. Mm -hmm. uh, and that we talked about OPEC here. I mean, we're going to just throw that away and let them become dominant again. That would be a huge national security uh, issue for us. And last but not least, let's not lose the fact that this would raise costs on the consumer. Mm -hmm. uh, because if uh, we are forced to only consume our domestic resources from North America and the, our producers don't have export, they're, they're going to start producing less. Right. And that really is a lose-lose for the American economy. So serious consequences. Those investor protections are fundamental. Uh, and they are present in all other trade agreements. I don't know why we want to make something new here. I agree. I agree. Mr. Thompson. Yeah, so I echo everything uh, Ms. Halbert said. Uh, we, we have members that are investing at the moment hundreds of millions of dollars to enter the Mexican downstream market. Uh, if you take away ISDS protections, it's going to jeopardize that. Uh, we need to make sure that the Mexican market stays open. We need an agreement that locks that in, and we need to protect our investors. It's critical that the ISDS mechanisms remain in NAFTA. Okay, so I mean, just, just simply, I mean, to put it this way, I mean, on one hand, um, the White House says we believe in energy dominance for our country and for North America. On the other hand, the USTR is undercutting that by any conversation about getting rid of the ISDS mechanisms. Is that a simple way to put it? And we hope through continued discussions that they can understand how, is, how important it is for all the reason I articulated. But at the end of the day, if we're trying to protect American investors, let's not take away the thing that protects American investors. Exactly. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman is back. The chair now calls upon the gentleman from the Commonwealth of Virginia, Mr. Griffith, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Let me apologize to you and for the committee. I usually like to come and listen to everything, and today, because I've been in another committee hearing, I have been unable to do so. But uh, your testimony is important, and we appreciate you being here today. Um, so I have no problem with us trading with our friends uh, north and south, but there needs to be, I believe, a more balanced and fair deal between our respective countries. My district in southwest and south side Virginia was devastated by NAFTA, and we lost tens of thousands of jobs. You know, back when that was all going on, you know, there'd be a press conference and 3,000 people would be out of work. We didn't get those jobs back. We also have a heavy, uh, that was textiles predominantly. We also have a heavy uh, dose of coal in my district. And, you know, it, it, it shows me part of the problem we have with NAFTA. A lot of the coal mining in Mexico, and we're not importing a lot, but we do some, but that's not the issue. The point is they have coal mines there, but a large part of their coal industry is now controlled or managed by elements of their drug cartels. And the working conditions are horrible. But we're supposed to be considered equals. And the same problem happens with all industries. So what do we do in areas that have been devastated, like my district, where the jobs never came back, the help from the federal government was never there to rebuild our economy, and I'm dealing with uh, communities that have parts of their downtown that used to flourish that are now, you know, there's, there's a block I'm thinking of in particular just empty. All the stores are gone. It's not like it's a shell of itself. It's just not there. It's a ghost part of that community. Part of it's surviving, but just barely. Part of it's doing better. How do we solve that problem? As we look at making a better deal, how do we rectify when you have disparities in working conditions, disparities in regulations that then make the American product uh, uncompetitive against our colleagues uh, and our friends in the South who don't have those rules? And somewhat to Canada, but they're more like us in the regard of their regulations and rules. Who wants to handle that one? Well, I'll take a, a stab at one part of that. Well, two parts of it. First, I do think it's important to recognize that coal exports are on the rise in America, and 13 percent of all of our coal exports are going into Canada and Mexico, predominantly Mexico, right? So they are a good and important and potentially growing uh, destination for our coal exports. Uh, on the relocation of industries, you know, I think that is why we find ourselves back at the table, that we want to update and modernize uh, NAFTA from where it was, you know, 30 some odd years ago, and that there's an opportunity to, to open up some of these things and look at that. And it's complicated. And if you've ever been in a trade negotiation, you know, if you come out with the, the acronyms they use are, are mind boggling. 
Uh, and so I think that's the, the reason we're at the table. At the end of the day, there are going to be, you know, industries that choose to move for economic reasons. That's been the history of free enterprise and capital markets and free trade. Uh, but there are things that we're looking at, you know, at the coal industry in particular, about we have the Appalachian hub that's going to be built, a new ethylene storage hub in Appalachia that will take some of those uh, coal miners and put them to work in something else. Where in Appalachia is that going to be? Well, that's a great question, and that's up for the industry to decide, and those and all of the the uh, the states in Appalachia decide what makes the most sense. But at the end of the day, it will benefit that region and provide sort of a, 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 a you know a relief valve for some of the, the the miners that lost their jobs. But it's not just NAFTA. I think we have to realize it's robotics, it's artificial intelligence, it's mega you know data, it's all kinds of things that you know 21st technology has brought us. Uh, that make moving around a little bit easier. Well, let me just say, I actually believe that if we could get some of our textile industry back, it would mostly be robotics, but that would still be some good high-paying jobs. But when we lost those jobs 20 years ago, 25 years ago, it was all based on regulations and wages, and it just disappeared in a matter of a couple of years. We went from being vibrant to having been crushed. We made a bad deal. we got to fix it. Thank you. I yield back. Jimmy is back. The chair now calls upon the gentleman at the Bakken Shale played his home state of North Dakota, Mr. Kramer, for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We're known for lots of other things as well. A lot of food. Um, first of all, and I'm sorry I had to step off for a little bit, but this has been a really good hearing. All of you, tremendous job. Thank you. Very well done. And I share all of your concern with um, what's going on with regard to NAFTA. And it's particularly in the energy area, and I'm concerned about some other things too, but the energy area being sort of new, if you will, since NAFTA was first um, passed, just seems to present so many opportunities. But here's an opportunity I want to raise, j just sort of rhetorically, and then get your responses to it. And by the way, I'm going to be I'm going to be sort of fuel agnostic on this. I really don't think the fuel <laughs> matters. I think that what matters is whether it's intellectual, whether it's fossil, whether it's technology. I just there's so much opportunity. But <clears throat> we talk a lot about trade with one another, you know, the big three of us, and we're all important to each other. I don't, as I like to tell the, my, my Canadian friends, however, um, as important as you are to us, we're critical to you. So we, we have a, a leverage that, uh, uh, that that you don't, and always remember that. Our, and our president understands that very well. Um, so t anyway, but here's what I think we miss so oftentimes in the discussion that I, I wish, I wish we could could get to. Just as sure as all the statistics you've you've shared in terms of how much we trade with one another, and what lar a large percentage of our business with, you know, the the, the other two, Mexico and Canada. You know, I think somebody said it, it, the next 10 added up don't add up to what, in certain, in certain areas, what uh, Mexico and Canada add up to for us in terms of market. What, what, ex in, what I get enthused about is the opportunity as a block, as a seamless, and by the way, when I was sitting here earlier, I, I pulled up my, one of my favorite maps in the world is the North American Petroleum Products Pipeline Map. It knows nothing of borders. And I, I, I remember the first time we reversed a pipeline in North Dakota that instead of bringing you know, Canadian crude down, um, we sent Bakken crude up on the very same line, just not, not necessarily even to get it to, to Saskatchewan, but perhaps to get it to the Gulf Coast. I mean, that's how important that infrastructure is. So I appreciate all the emphasis on infrastructure. But what I, I just, I'd love to just hear some comments and, and maybe uh, beginning with you, Ms. Harbert, and all of you could if you, if you have an opinion. but. What, what's the potential opportunity from a security as well as a, a economic security as well as a national and, and energy security opportunity if we as a block get our act together, harmonize everything we're talking about, and then in, and then who needs OPEC, right? I mean, that's, <laughs> that's, sort of, that's sort of how, I, how I view it. So just open it up for discussion. Absolutely. The national security dividend of this should not go unnoticed in the energy sector. First, from an American standpoint, we are importing more oil from uh, Canada and Mexico than we are from OPEC. And so that's been a change in energy fortune for sure. And the opportunity to fully develop the resources of Canada, the United States, and Mexico and become the center of the world's energy market, uh, which would send shockwaves into not just OPEC but Russia, 
uh, sort of warms my heart. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that, that we shouldn't lose. This is not just an economic negotiation. This is a national security negotiation as well, because the stronger we are, the more competitive we are on the world stage as a block, if you will. But also, from an energy standpoint, the more energy secure we are, the more economic, the more national yeah. secure we are. And that provides our allies uh, with choices of where they can get their oil, their gas, their technology. They can't, probably can't import the renewables, mm -hmm. but there's growing uh, renewables within our block, and it's a, it's a tremendous win-win. Mr. Thompson. Well, let me, let me say without sounding too corny, I mean, I, I think it would give us lots of things. It would give us unprecedented freedom in North America, freedom and, and to take away the leverage that the rest of the world or certain parts of the world have over us now. It will give us prosperity. Uh, pros uh, our nations will prosper, our employees will prosper, our consumers will prosper, will continue to benefit from low oil prices and low gasoline prices and good high paying jobs. Um, and we can become an em energy dominant region. Uh, I think the, the possibilities are endless. We should all be, you know, trying to get there. Doctor? Um, in our report to the Department of Energy uh, on these issues, we call very strongly for uh, thinking about ways of moving towards this block uh, uh, concept that you're talking about, and we talk about that as well. So I think um, uh, the way to move forward on this is uh, to give uh, DOE um, responsibility and the charge to uh, develop uh, pathways for the future. What are the current challenges? Uh, how deep do you have to go in environmental policy and tax policy to make all this a reality? Uh, you know, I'm amazed at how much agreement there is about moving in this direction, and it's great, uh, but uh, someone needs to think through it carefully. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman is back. The chair thanks him for bringing up the block we call NAPEC, North American Petroleum Exporting Countries. And seeing that there are no further members wish to ask questions, I'd like to thank all of our witnesses for being here today. Merry Christmas. And in pursuit to committee rules, I remind remember, members that they have 10 business days to submit additional questions for the record, and I ask that all witnesses submit their responses within 10 business days upon receipt of those questions. Without objection, this subcommittee is adjourned. <laughs>